Right, so now we're going to get into specifics of how we mathematically represent or capture these uh, signals that are of interest to us in 1D and 2D. So this is a quick overview of what I'm going to be covering, uh, the concept of basis functions. Um, and order, in order to make use of those basis functions, we're going to have to deal with understanding shifting of an independent variable. All will become clear as we go along. We're going to look at um, representing 1D and 2D signals in terms of so-called delta functions, which we'll get to. And then when we've done that, we'll then basically have, if you like, a right-hand side for our function descriptions. Up until now, we've said we've got some function of time, some function of space. We've already be, always been dealing with f of x, f of t, but we've never had what is the mathematics on the right-hand side of that expression, because it's not going to be just one simple analytic function. It's going to be a bit more involved than that, and so that's now what we'll be uh, getting into. So, basis functions. The idea on this slide that you need to get is that our function f of x, shown on the left-hand side there, is going to be equal to a collection of simple functions. So here, I'm calling b of x and k a simple function, something that we can deal with without problems. We know what a system is going to, going to do to that function. Um, and that's, in essence, it. We're just going to use a summation. That's the capital uh, sigma here for summation. Um, a summation of those basis functions. And each of them will just be specially weighted by some amount, some coefficient, some amplitude, um, such that when we sum them all together, we get a representation of our function. Now, of course, there are going to be many possible uh, basis functions. Maybe it's not obvious to you, but hopefully it will become clear that, in fact, there are infinitely many options that we could choose. But here we're going to use uh, a really convenient um, starting point called the delta function. But to get into that, we've got to understand um, about independent variables a bit more than what we've covered so far. So, um, we've got it here we've got an example of a discrete signal x of n. So what we need to understand um, in looking at this, this signal, this function, is that we might want to plot um, such a signal. And so imagine we just had the list of numbers. What would we do with the list of numbers to get the signal? Well, we'd start off with a value of n. For example, here, taking an extreme case, could start out close to minus infinity. So we'd be off on the left-hand side of that graph. And then we just, for each choice of the value of n as we start from huge negative numbers working all the way towards zero here. We'd plug those values of n, those indices if you like, the independent variable, plug it in, find the value of x. So as we come along here we'd then be beginning to see the function here so that when we're at zero we've got this value x of n and then we just carry on through to approaching n equals plus infinity. The point being to plot a function we plug in values of n and see what the value is of the function, and then just show the discrete result. So um, on this slide, I am showing uh, that same discrete function, x of n, but now we just want to plot what does x of n minus some value, some constant, look like. So to consider what it looks like, and here the answer is already shown to us, but I just want to talk you through it so as you understand. Um, how do we plot x of n minus n0? Well, we do exactly what I just described. Uh, we start out with values of n from large negative values, constantly working all the way through, approaching zero, and then n goes up to larger and larger values. And for each of those values of n, this time we've got to subtract off whatever that shift value n0 is. Okay, so take our n that we're interested in, subtract off some n0, some constant shift value, and then look up in the original function what the value x is. So in the example shown here, um, we're going to use um, that constant n0 is equal to 10. So that means that when we scroll through, when we consider all of our n values, um, if you could imagine when we get to the case of n equals 0 here, 
that means we're going to be looking up a value. What's the value of x at 0 minus 10, if n0 is 10? So look back here then. Um, minus 10 is probably around here somewhere. And so in fact, the function value isn't explicitly shown here. And so sure enough, uh, likewise here, we're getting um, not yet the, the clear function. But to make it clearer, as we go along, say, to the value of when n, our free parameter here, n, when that's equal, independent variable, when that's equal to n0, then we're going to have n0 minus n0 equals 0, which means look up x for when n equals 0, when the net n is 0. And so you get this function value that was at the origin of x of n. And that is the value that we plot for n equals n0 on the, on the function xn minus n0. Okay? And so you can use the same logic um, to see that we get this important result. And the reason I've spelled it out in such detail is that it's not kind of intuitively obvious. We would naturally think, you know, x of n minus 10, we would imagine naively that just shifts it off to the left. Whereas in fact, um, n minus 10 shifts it to the right by, um, by 10 units of the independent variable. So I hope with this explicit slide, you will understand the important concept that x minus 2 as an independent variable shifts to the right by 2. Okay, so take your time to think that through if that's not obvious, but hopefully it will just become very natural to you. Um, so if n were to be a time um, independent variable, then we see that xn minus n0 is, if you like, a, a temporally delayed version. Or if it's a spatial independent variable, then it's a, you know, a positively uh, shifted uh, version of that function and not negatively shifted. That's the key point. Okay, with that concept hopefully in mind, let's now look at um, a really key simple building block function okay, that we're going to be using called a delta function. Now, because we're dealing with discrete signals here, we're going to call this the Kronecker delta. Don't worry about uh, calling it chronica delta. You can very much get away with just calling it the delta function um, for a discrete domain. Everyone will understand. You can write that scientifically in papers, no problem. Um, and so the function is just this. Um, from We again consider values, integer values of n from minus infinity all the way up through to plus infinity. And basically this function is zero everywhere except when that integer index, the independent variable, is equal to zero. When n is equal to zero, by definition, the delta function, the Kronecker delta, is equal to one. Okay, so that you can see already is quite clearly an important building block for the discrete function. So I think you can hopefully see already where we're going to be going with this. We're just going to be adding together shifted copies of this delta function. Um, now, for discrete time signals, this will often be referred to as a, a unit impulse or even just an impulse. When we're dealing with spatial signals, for example, in the context of PET, we could view this as a point source or a point. Even for optical imaging, you could view it as a point. Imagine you're taking a photo of the night sky with stars. Each of those stars can be counted as if it's a point source, for example. Okay, um, so this is a more explicit definition again of that Kronecker delta function um, showing what it would look like. Um, specifically, there's the case we looked at before, delta of n. Uh, if there's no shift in that independent variable n, then it's just zero everywhere except at when n equals equal to zero, then the delta function is equal to one. Now, as we've seen by careful consideration of the shift um, in the earlier slide, we know that um, negatives here, so n minus 1, n minus 2, corresponds to a shift of plus 1 or plus 2 as we plot the function. So that's what I'm showing explicitly here. I've got a delta function, which is equal to a value of 1. And when we go along the n values in the independent variable here, when n is equal to 2 here, okay, on this x-axis, if you like, the horizontal axis, the n-axis, when n, n is equal to 2, we've got 2 minus 2. That means 0 as the input to the delta function. And when we have um, uh, a zero input here, so there you are, n is equal to zero, then the delta function is equal to one, okay? 
And so likewise here, if we now had n plus 1, that corresponds to a shift to the left. Right, so this is how we construct 1D discrete functions. So here I've got an arbitrary example. Uh, we'll move on to another example in the next slide. Just an arbitrary example of a signal x of n, okay, going from possibly minus infinity to plus infinity. Just got these discrete samples. And what we're going to do is express x of n as a weighted sum of shifted delta functions, okay. And just a reminder, this is not abstract, this is real stuff. This is exactly how we would represent, for example, an audio signal, a speech waveform, a piece of music, whatever it is. It's a set, a series of samples, a weighted collection of delta impulses. So let's look at this example of x of n. And all that function is equal to is a, a summation of these delta functions that have been shifted. So um, looking at, um, for example, this point in the signal here, okay, where n is equal to minus 2, to, to express uh, the function, we just say, well, look up the value x of the function evaluated at n is equal to minus 2. So that's what we're showing here. x is the value of the function evaluated at n is equal to minus 2. So we can view that as a constant, if you like, a coefficient for this function here, okay? n is in here, okay, so this is a function. This can be considered to be like a constant, an evaluation of x of n, but this is a function, okay? And so it's just delta n plus two, okay? Because we want it positioned at minus, at minus two, and we've seen we've got to have a plus two for that. So that expresses just that single, um, scaled impulse. It's just got a, an amplitude, the amplitude not of 1, but it's just scaled by x evaluated at minus 2. And then we go on to the next one. So we're going from n is equal to minus 2 to n is equal to minus 1. And we see we've got this negative um, impulse here. So that's n is equal to minus 1. So we evaluate the function x at n is equal to minus 1. That gives us the coefficient or the amplitude of a delta function, and it's a function because we've still got the free independent variable n in there, except, of course, we're now shifted only by one sample to the left. And you can carry on um, doing that for all of the others, and that's what we're showing on this slide here. So the function x of n is equal to a weighted collection. So these are the weights, and obviously just the function evaluated at all the different n values from minus infinity all the way up to plus infinity. So here we're at n minus 2 n minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2. x is the function value evaluated at those n values. And then those are the weights or the coefficients or the amplitudes for these delta functions, these delta of n's. But of course, they all have to be specially shifted and positioned to the sample point that we're wanting to express. And so that's how we end up with this expression here. So the function x of n that's on the left-hand side, is just equal to the delta function, okay, shifted to a position k in general. I've shown you explicit evaluations there, but in general, a position k, um, and we just evaluate that function at position k, and that gives us the scaling factor, the coefficient for this delta function, for this basis function. And all we have to do is just add them all together for all the possible n values from minus infinity to plus infinity. And so, because we want to keep n as an independent variable, it means that if I'm going to do this kind of um, summation here, um, I need to visit the function at all these different points explicitly. And so that's why I'm just using this summation index k to just, uh, it's like a dummy variable of summation, just to visit all the function values and use those function values to weight the delta functions. So when you look at mathematical expressions like this, take a look carefully at what's going on. Here we're summing over k. So that means if we're summing over k, generally speaking, for the kinds of equations we're dealing with, then we don't expect to see k on the left-hand side. So k will, will disappear after the summation, because we're summing it out, integrating it out. But notice n is not touched here at all, so the n here 
is left over as we require um, as the independent variable for the function x of n. And so it's as simple as that. It's almost a uh, tautology. It's almost just stating the obvious. It's saying, um, so for any example, 1D signal, whether it's some arbitrary example that we've looked at, or whether it's a time activity curve, whether it's a speech waveform, we're just saying that signal is a summation of the evaluations of that signal at particular points, and the evaluation at those particular points is used as the scaling factor for that chronica delta, that, that, that unit impulse. And so if it's a temporal signal, it would be, tend to be called an impulse. If it's a spatial signal, these are like point sources, if you like. And so here I'm just showing the variation in notation you may come across. So here we've considered the integer value n. And you'll remember that when we've got the square brackets, it means we're dealing with, a, uh, with an integer value, a discrete value. And uh, I'm just showing that you know, we could, of course, use x as the discrete uh, index. Um, we could use k as the summation. We could use uh, x prime. That comes up a lot for the summation index. And that's just what we use to represent the marker for where we visit the function, all of those points, to find the scale factor for the shifted copies of the delta function. So in fact, if you can understand that bottom right function, which I hope you can, because it's hopefully a very straightforward concept, then you're already in a superb position for understanding convolution, which we'll be getting to. Because what we're saying is a function f of x is just equal to uh, a weighted set of shifted functions. And in this case, it's just the delta function. Um, okay, and then in this slide, we're taking that concept and saying, well, actually, we can extend that to 2D quite easily. So instead of that, you know, just uh, visiting uh, along points on a line in those integer increments, we can do the same in a 2D grid. And so that's what I'm showing here. We just literally repeat the process for the two dimensions. So now we take the delta function, shift it to x equals k, shift it to y equals l, and then evaluate the function at that coordinate kl, and then just keep summing that over all the possible kl values. And so here we're considering, if you like, the worst possible case of infinity, minus infinity, plus infinity, to reconstruct, to recompose, or to synthesize the uh, original function f, x, y.